Um, welcome to this Intelligence Squared event hosted by uh, Saatchi. Uh, my name is Mark War, and I'm the Executive Director of A Foundation with the A over here. And um, I'm delighted that you've all turned up to hear what I think is going to be a pretty serious game of ping pong. Uh, and the uh, topic at question is that art fairs are all about money and not art. And the format is a, a series of um, uh, pro and con contributions from our panel. Um, and then um, you'll be invited to feedback. And then a little bit more uh, feedback from our panel up here. And then a vote. Um, I think you're actually probably going to have to put your hands up first to actually say what your position is at the beginning of the debate in this position of silence. And then after they've accrued an economy of uh, intelligence around the debate, then to see if you shift it. So that's hopefully where we're going to go. So ready with your hands. Um, anyway, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Simone de Puré, who's going to chair the event. Thank you. Good evening. So my name is Simon de Puri. In normal life, I'm an auctioneer. I'm the chairman of Philips de Puri and Company. And so when I see such a fantastic audience, I would feel much more at ease if I had a gavel in my hand and we could just do an amazing auction. But uh, tonight, I was asked to conduct an exercise that I'm not at all used to, which is to moderate a, an extraordinarily heated debate between the protagonist sitting at one end of the table and those sitting at the other end of the table. And so my, mo my role is not so much to moderate, but is the role of a timekeeper, because they're very, very strict rules, I was told. And I have to make sure that nobody speaks longer than any of his opponents. So, or her opponents, exactly. And uh, I have an incredibly amazing watch here. Uh, its only problem is that it doesn't give the time. It only gives the altitude and the depth. So, which <laughs> in this particular debate might not be very useful. That's why I have bought my specially, special uh, Blackberry. And as you will see, it's a special, uh, uh, special one. And uh, hopefully, this will allow me to uh, read the time accurately. Now, uh, we are sp the, the debate is about Art fairs are about money, not art. And before we uh, pass on to the uh, speakers for the motion and the speakers against the motion, we are going to find out what you, before you have heard our six brilliant panelists, what you think about the subject matter. And then we will again ask to do a show of hands right at the end of it all when we all have, will have had the benefit of the brilliant input of our six colleagues sitting at the table. So uh, the, the, we need three answers, uh, basically. I mean, either you are for it, i.e. for the fact that our fares are about money, not R, or you are against the motion, or you just simply don't know. So can I ask all the ones who are for the motion, i.e. that art fairs are about money, not art, to now show your hands? OK, that's interesting. Now, I hope that I have some independent judges who will uh, <laughs> observe this and take into account. OK, well, that's quite a, a substantial amount of people who have raised their hand saying that art fairs are about money, not art. Now, uh, those of you who feel that, who are against that statement, uh, please show your hands now. Well, it, 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 you're not allowed to raise your hand twice, by the way, but <laughs> <laughs> it looks like marginally less, maybe, but nearly as much, but marginally less. Now, those of you who don't have a clue, Please, who don't know, <laughs> please raise your hands. My God, uh, uh, quite a substantial number as well. So uh, our, the work is cut out for our debaters to sway the opinions around and to make them change their opinions and to really uh, uh, don't hold back with your opinions. First of all, we want a heated, uh, animated, aggressive uh, <laughs> debate. So. Uh, we will start with the speakers for the motion. Uh, and the first speaker to speak is Louisa Buck. Louisa is a writer, 
broadcaster on contemporary art. She writes for the art newspaper. She's a regular reviewer on BBC, on BBC radio, TV, and she has written all the key books on the subject of contemporary art, i.e. Moving Targets, a user's guide to British art now. She has written Market Matters, the dynamics of the contemporary art market, and she has written Owning Art, the Contemporary Art Collector's Handbook, co-authored with Judith Green. And she was a judge for the 2005 Turner Prize. So now, Louisa Buck, you have exactly six minutes. Okay, so as I said, when I first started writing about contemporary art back in the 80s, art fairs really were these insider affairs. You know, dealers, and nobody ever called themselves a gallerist, loaded up their stands with stock, and they dealt. Artists usually had to be cajoled to donate works, and many, I'm thinking particularly of Anselm Kiefer, he springs to mind, wouldn't, and in his case still don't, have any truck with allowing their primary market work to be shown in such a grubbly commercial setting. Well, that was then and this is now, and as we all know, over the last 10 years, in the face of the expansion and globalisation of the art market, artists have become immeasurably more market savvy, and fairs have burgeoned, proliferated, and become ever more sophisticated at marketing themselves. Yes, they're now glamorous, glitzy, must-visit events, but they crucially go to huge pains to emphasize their cultural significance. There's much talk of curating the stands. Selection committees prowl the aisles for quality control. And amidst the strata of VIP schedules and nuanced abundance of parties, there are also serious panel discussions, programs of performance art, and specially commissioned artist projects. The more bizarre and seemingly non-commercial, the better. But jolly nice as all this is, art fairs today, and never more so than the current financial climate, are still nakedly commercial enterprises. They exist to sell, sell, sell. And if they don't sell, they don't survive. And if this new fair being launched in Liverpool in a couple of weeks' time is to be a real functioning annual art fair, rather than an art exhibition assuming the format of a fair, then it has to attract serious sales, regardless of how interesting it may be curatorially. Take Art Basel and the Venice Biennale. They go back to back, and the common cry is, what's the difference? Innumerable sales are made out of Venice's pavilions, and it's often said you can see more high quality and better curated art at Art Basel. Well, that's as maybe. And art and money have been in bed together since the beginning of time. But amidst all these seething agendas, the fact remains that Venice exists as an art exhibition, with the art and the artists selected by curators whereas Basel exists as a commercial enterprise with the art selected by dealers and where everything is for sale. And that, for me, is where the basic benchmark stands. Adventurous projects at art fairs are all very well, but in reality, they're bit players. Aesthetic amuse-bouche, a way for a fair to distinguish itself from the herd and to claim the cultural high ground to make it all seem a little less ka -ching. They're often for sale anyway. I always remember that Roman Ondax randomly forming queue a few freezers ago was bought for Tate, no less. So it's great that Freeze does all that it does, and its, pro its project's programme have certainly been a highly successful way of building its edgy but serious brand and staving off the competition. But it still has to flog that square meterage, and galleries will only buy that square meterage if the event is financially worth their while. A few obscure and interesting spaces from the far corners of the globe, or indeed the far boroughs of East London, may be allowed in to spice things up a bit, but it's the high-enders and their stables of big sellers that really count. And while the work can be great, there's not many surprises there. But there's no doubt, if you've got sufficient powers of focus and a good enough filtration system to edit out all the surrounding cacophony, you can see some truly, truly wonderful things at an art fair. But let's be honest, however well designed the venue, however curated the booths, even in the face of great pieces, art fairs are a pretty horrible way to look at art. They're crammed, they're overwhelming, they're crowded, they're knackering. And as dealers are all too aware, some art can hold its own in this context a lot better than others, irrespectively of quality. I mean, God, I got sick of Mark Quinn's giant eyeball gazing out from what seemed like far too many stands throughout the fairs last year. For where the art's concerned, the fairs provide a fascinating insight into what the market deems are the flavours of this or that moment. As Jenny Holtz have famously said, money creates taste. And the dealers then strategize about which of the stadium rockers were sticking out at the front of your booth and which of the acoustic indie bands that just take a discreet little quiet corner in the back of the booths. And it doesn't matter what's going on anywhere else in the art world. In a fair, it has to fit the format. 
Even if in artist studios across the world, film, video, or sculptural installation is super strong, in an art fair, only a few brave souls, and there always are a few, will display such work. But overall, who has time at an art fair to sit in front of a screen for half an hour or be prepared to fill their expensive booth with just one or two works? They might have been a bit more inclined when the market was booming, but they sure as hell aren't going to now. Certainly, dealers strategize endlessly about what kind of work to take to what kind of fair, but the remit is predominantly commercial rather than curatorial. A bit of bling for Miami, a bit of class for Basel, a bit of edgy for Freeze. The prime purpose is to sell rather than to show. And as me and my colleagues know, when we're writing the daily editions of the art newspaper, Art Basel, Art Basel Miami, the Armory and Freeze, what art fairs showcase best is not really the art, but the art market and the art world. The key players, the networking, the schmoozing, the spotting, the plotting and the speculating. The main fairs are terrific clan gatherings while local fairs often form a great, great local snapshot. Fairs provide a privileged one-stop view into what the major players and the more marginal commercial galleries are doing, what they're strutting as their stuff. There's nothing wrong with art fairs. There can be great spectacles, fantastic fun, sales make livings, for God's sake. And you can see some utterly amazing art, but never forget that for a fair to be giving the impression of putting the art and the artists at the core of its activities also makes, at the moment, very sound financial sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Louisa. That was totally brilliant, as far as timekeeping is concerned, because uh, you spoke exactly for six minutes. And I, I checked it not on my extraordinary yellow Blackberry. I saw it on your own watch, because you... Uh, I'm happy to see that you wear a Swiss railway watch. And so there is no more precise watch than that in the world. Now, uh, we have as first speaker against the motion, Richard Wentworth, one of Britain's greatest leading sculptors. And <laughs> And I see that <laughs> you are ideally equipped and prepared and dressed for the occasion. And so if I may ask you to come to the podium, and we look forward to hearing you speaking against the motion. So it's my pacemaker. <laughs> um. I haven't prepared. Uh, this is a nation, this is um, a city-state called London, uh, which is in a part of the um, United Kingdom, which is, we call, they call this bit England. So this is a very privileged, and I can tell you, almost uniformly white group of people who are able to rock up tonight to entertain the delicacies of this problem. We love a little problem. Uh, I think we're really here to discuss um, our anxieties. Uh, and what we should recognize straight away is that we are economic. Every single person here is economic. That's the only way you can be. So some kind of <coughs> unease about money being exchanged or somebody doing somebody a favor seems to me always slightly sad. It's a very, um, I, I associate it with a kind of London sneer. Uh, so yesterday I thought, well, I better get to a fair and see what they're like. And if you read uh, Cobbett's, I think it's in Cobbett's Country Rides, which is 1820, uh, around the time that some of these buildings were put up, you can read that Cobbett was already complaining about shops. Nice thing to do in the King's Road. He was already saying, what about the market? What about the market? The market's the place. These terrible things called shops are coming. 1820 is about three grandfathers ago, so it's immediate. So I went to a fair. I couldn't find an art fair, but I did find a bottle collector's fair. And I even bought a little book in the bottle collector's fair. Everybody was eating crisps. You can pass these round. 
And uh, crisps have interesting new names, as you'll see. If you open... Uh, the Bottle Collectors Fair was full of only men. There were no women in it at all. It's a complete, small, tribal group of people who evidently collect bottles. <laughs> and uh, they, too, have connoisseurs. They have people who are the world authority on this or that stopper, closure. Uh, they have codes for understanding what they look at. Rarity code, rarity code B, rarity code A, rarity, rarity code E. Everything is known to this group of people. Enjoy. <laughs> <coughs> so we're another group. This is another tribe. This is probably a tribe that really like, enjoys to talk, but it's also a tribe which enjoys to look. But I think we're actually here to just discuss conversion. There are no um, economists teaching in art schools. It's almost nobody in an art school knows how a choice is made. Uh, very few people here probably know how a choice is made. But actually, is there anyone here um, with a lighter or some matches? <laughs> Good. No, I'm going to, you're, you're in charge. Uh, Anyone with a lighter or matches? I've seen people smoking. OK. These are for you. You can light a fire with those. OK. And if you pass them to the right person, they'll even tell you what kind of wood it is, because, of course, people are connoisseurs of wood as well. So if you doubt our vigilance, if you doubt our ability to make decisions about why one thing is one thing and another is another, and to make comparisons, I brought you some earth, that most ordinary of things. It lies not very far away from these exceptionally wide floorboards, which tells you that you're in a site of power. Always judge the floorboard width, and you'll know. <laughs> the earth is in a sachet, probably made, well, possibly made from Iraqi oil, but we just call it plastic sachet. And with earth, if you know what to do, you can make a brick, which is also one of the oldest things in the world, and still one of the most brilliant intentions in the world, the fact that somebody intended that, and it becomes a thing. And without that thing, we wouldn't be here, in, not in this situation. So my point is that I will go anywhere to look at more or less anything. I am not disturbed by the make of car that passes me or the cut of the skirt. If I think I'm going to find something interesting to look at, I'll go to it. And I would much rather be in a world of fairs and fairs which are stocked with things in which I, in my extremely privileged way, can discriminate. I like to discriminate. I like to think some people are shits and other people <laughs> are interesting. I even like to realise that some people are shits and are interesting shits. <laughs> but without a range of people to work with, or a range of things to look at, or a range of languages to speak, or a range of cultures to explore, I wouldn't be able to work out who I was. And it's an incredibly privileged thing to be able to do. It's what I do, and I would very happily go to an art fair any time as one component of that process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard Wentworth. Uh, and by the way, you're totally right about the floorboards because we have very beautiful floorboards as well if you come to Howick Place at Philippe de Puri. <laughs> However, they are only about a third in size of these floorboards. So I, I could not concur more with your statement about fl floorboards. Now, we have the second speaker who is going to speak for the motion, which is Jasper Joff, painter, writer, curator, who set up the free art fair as an alternative to the art market's focus on price and status. So, Jasper Joff. Hello. I'm an artist. I set up the free art fair. At the free art fair, we did the opposite of freeze. We had 50 artists doing serious bits of art, and they gave away their work for free. We had homeless people become art collectors. We had people queuing overnight for two nights to get a piece of art. 
We had last year at the Barbican, we had 1,000 people come to get a piece of art. Um, we had free entry, we had free catalogs, which I'm handing around, take one if you want one. Um, and we did it all for free, we had absolutely no funding. Um, the first piece of art to go last year was by a 19-year-old artist who's completely unknown. The second piece was by Marlene Dumas, who's the highest selling female artist in the world. Art isn't just about money. The free art fair is the exception that proves the rule. Here are some facts to end the debate that the Freeze art fair and other art fairs like that are about money. This is from the 2005 press release from Freeze. Sales figures are predicted to exceed last year's 26 million with some gallerists selling out within hours of the fair opening. Uh, Nicholas Logsdale, Richard Wentworth's gallerist. Between the art fair and the gallery, it's like to be, likely to be in the region of two million pounds. <laughs> Molly Dent Brocklehurst, it was great. We've done a lot of business. The price level that one can achieve at the fair has markedly improved. She's the director of Gagosian. Barbara Gladstone, the fair is extremely well organized and the business part was beyond our expectations. Director of sales at White Cube. Although last year's sales were very good, this year they're even better. <laughs> it's cost 15 pounds to get into Freeze, which is like paying to go into Harrods. It's like going into a shopping mall. It costs 215 pounds to apply to be in Freeze. It costs between 6,000 pounds and 32,000 pounds to have a stall in Freeze. Art fairs are about money. Okay, what's the problem with that? That's the more interesting.